In the world of chemistry, we have so many elements that we need to classify them properly. The quest for this began in the early 1800s and we went through a lot of models of the periodic table. For example, the Dobereiner's triads, the Newlands octaves, Lothermeyer's curves, Mendeleev's periodic table. All of these were based on the idea that the properties of elements are a periodic function of the atomic masses. Yes, Mendeleev's periodic table was considerably better than the others because Mendeleev had also considered a lot of experimental evidence. Now, in 1913, Henry mostly paved the way for the modern periodic law. He was doing X-ray spectroscopy with a lot of different different elements. In his experiment, he found out that there is a linear relationship between the root of the frequency of the emitted X-rays and this new curious number. He called it Z. Then he called it the atomic number and hence came the modern periodic law that the properties of elements are a function of their atomic numbers. Later on it was figured out that this atomic number is nothing but the number of protons inside the nucleus of an atom. So, the way we've learned to fill electrons into the orbitals of an atom in electronic configuration back in atomic structure, we are going to use the same model in order to synthesize the entire periodic table. So while filling electrons in an atom, imaginarily, if the last electron goes into the s orbital, we'll put it in the s block in the periodic table. Similarly, if the last electron goes into the p orbitals, it belongs to the p block, d orbital, d block, f orbital, f block. Yes, d orbital elements are also known as transition elements, f orbital elements are also known as the inner transition elements. These transition elements and inner transition elements tend to show multiple variable oxidation states. For the s block, it is filled with metals, p block has both metals and non-metals, so metals are towards the left side of the periodic table and non-metals are towards the right side of the periodic table. Now coming to the nitty-gritties of this chapter, the concepts. The first concept we learned was shielding effect or screening effect. What happens is, in an atom, there is a valence electron, the outermost electron, and at the middle of the atom, there is the nucleus. Now between the outermost electron and the nucleus, there are lots of other electrons. Because of these inner electrons, this outermost electron cannot feel the full effect of the nuclear charge. And this phenomena is known as the screening effect, the shielding of the total nuclear charge because of inner electrons on the valence electron is called shielding effect. So mathematically, let's say the total nuclear charge is Z, which is obviously proportional to the atomic number and the charge faced by the outermost electron will be called the effective nuclear charge because we'll write it as Z minus sigma. This sigma is known as the screening constant or shielding constant and it varies for different different atoms and ions. So obviously if there are more inner electrons there would be more shielding effect also, the shapes of the orbitals, the types of orbitals, have a lot of effect on the screening effect. S orbital electrons show the most amount of shielding. Then P orbital electrons. D orbital electrons have very less shielding effect and F orbital electrons have a very, very, very poor screening effect. So talking about the general trend of effective nuclear charge, when you go from left to right in a periodic table, the effective nuclear charge keeps on increasing. And when you go from top to bottom in the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge keeps on decreasing. Then came the idea of atomic radius. Technically speaking, the distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron is known as the radius of an atom. But in old days, there wasn't any accurate way of measuring this. So we used different different techniques. What we did was we defined covalent radius by taking the half of the distance from one nucleus to the other inside a covalent bond. Similarly, there is metallic radius where we take the distance between two nuclei inside a metallic bond. Then there is van der Waals radius. Now there are certain species in nature which do not form bonds, for example, the noble gas. So what we did was we took their solid forms and and found out the internuclear distance between two consecutive atoms and that is what we call van der Waals radius. So now if there was one species for which we measured all three types of radius, van der Waals radius would be the longest, then comes the metallic radius and then the covalent radius. Talking about the general trend of atomic radius from left to right, it keeps on 
decreasing and from top to bottom it keeps on increasing then comes the idea for ionic radius the important thing to remember over here is that if you take a bunch of isoelectronic species the one with the least amount of protons will have the largest radius the one with the most amount of protons will have the smallest radius and the example is right here on the screen then comes the idea of ionization enthalpy the energy needed to uproot one electron out of an atom is known as ionization enthalpy now this could be first ionization enthalpy when you're uprooting the first electron out of the atom it could be the successive second ionization enthalpy when you are taking out another electron converting the ion into a two positive then third ionization energy fourth ionization energy so on and so forth you can define it as much as you want one interesting fact about ionization energy is that it is always a positive number which means that you always have to give some energy to an atom to take an electron out of it now there is a certain graph in front of you in that graph please notice beryllium versus boron nitrogen versus oxygen magnesium versus aluminium and phosphorus versus sulfur these are the anomalies or the exceptions in the trend of ionization enthalpies now the idea over here is that beryllium and magnesium have fully filled valence orbitals nitrogen and phosphorus have half filled valence orbital so the thing is that they are slightly more stable than expected hence they have a little more ionization energy than what was expected talking about the general trend of ionization energy if we go from the left to the right ionization energy keeps on increasing if we go from top to the bottom ionization energy keeps on decreasing then comes electron gain enthalpy this is the energy absorbed or released whenever you give an extra electron into an atom Yes so whenever you convert a neutral atom into an ions that is when you talk about electron gain enthalpy now for noble gases obviously this is a positive value you have to provide them a lot of energy the reaction is endothermic to convert them into an ions pretty obvious because they don't want to change their electronic configuration for halogens and chalcogens however this value has a negative sign but a very huge magnitude which means that if i provide an electron to let's say chlorine or bromine or fluorine or oxygen or sulfur they will release a lot of energy now there was an old measure of this quantity as well and it was known as electron affinity electron affinity is mathematically almost the same as electron gain enthalpy in terms of its magnitude their signs are different so for example the electron gain enthalpy for chlorine is minus 350 kJ per mole but if i say electron affinity i will say that chlorine has an affinity of 350 kJ per mole with a positive sign both the statements mean that when i give one electron to chlorine it is going to release this much amount of energy overall the notable exceptions in electron gain enthalpy are oxygen and fluorine because the magnitude of energy they release on gaining the electron is lesser than sulfur and chlorine why is this so because oxygen and fluorine are very small so their charge density their electronic density is very high now whenever you're putting an extra electron into these atoms this new guy faces a lot of repulsion and hence the energy released is not as much as sulfur and chlorine so right now there is a trend of electron enthalpies in front of you you should notice that the halogens are at the top of this graph Now at the bottom apart from the noble gases notice the presence of nitrogen and phosphorus and magnesium and beryllium and zinc why is this so well because species like nitrogen and phosphorus as i told earlier have half filled orbitals already they don't want to change their configuration species like beryllium and magnesium they have a fully filled configuration already they don't want to change themselves and zinc as well is known as the pseudo noble gas element it has all orbitals fully filled hence it also does not want to change its electronic configuration talking about the general trend of electron affinity from left to right electron affinity keeps on increasing and from top to bottom it keeps on decreasing this is the general trend then comes one of the most misunderstood topics of this chapter and that is electronegativity electronegativity is the property of a bonded atom whatever we discussed till now ionization energy electron gain enthalpy these were the properties of an isolated gaseous atom that is how those are defined as standards electronegativity on the other hand is a tendency of the ability of an atom 
in a bonded state to be able to attract the shared pair of electrons towards itself. Yes. So the first thing is that electronegativity is not a physically measurable quantity. You have to think about it in relative terms. So for example, you fix hydrogen's electronegativity at 2.1. Then you measure the other atoms with respect to this value that you have assumed. Also, the value of electronegativity is not fixed for a certain atom. It depends on the conditions in which the atom exists. Also, a lot of scientists have tried to come up with a table for electronegativities, the most widely accepted, the most notable table for electronegativities was given by Linus Pauling. And now it is on your screen. So this table that was given back in 1932, notice it carefully. Hydrogen is fixed at 2.1 and then the rest of the elements follow. You should remember at least the first two periods of this particular table. Look at fluorine. Fluorine is fixed at 4.0. Then oxygen is 3.5, nitrogen 3, carbon 2.5, boron 2, beryllium 1.5 and lithium 1. So there is a steady decrease of 0.5 in these values. Then you can also try to remember the period in which you have sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine. Also remember that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. So now do you understand why fluorine is the most electronegative atom but chlorine has the most amount of electron affinity? Because electron affinity talks about an isolated atom. Fluorine, when talking about electronegativity, it is already bonded. So there is no electronic repulsion to take care of now. Hence, fluorine is the most electronegative. Once again, talking about the general trend of electronegativity, from left to right, it keeps on increasing and from top to bottom, it keeps on decreasing. Then let's quickly talk about the metallic characters of oxides and hydroxides. Metallic hydroxides and oxides are basic in nature. That's why we call them alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. For non-metals, the nature of oxides and hydroxides is acidic. And for certain elements in the middle of the periodic table, which are generally metalloids, their oxides are amphoteric in nature. Now let's talk about covalent character as a general thumb rule. Whenever two things bond with each other, if their electronegativity difference is more than 1.7, it is going to be an ionic bond. If it is less than 1.7, it is going to be a covalent bond. Now this is just a general rule. This does not apply to every bond out there, but it gives you a good idea of whether a bond would be covalent or not. Yes. So now there is a summary of all the trends that you should keep in your mind for the periodic table. Notice that electron gain enthalpy, ionization enthalpy and electronegativity are increasing as you go from left to right. Atomic radius decreases as you go from the left to right. Similarly, from top to bottom, ionization energy, electron gain enthalpy and electronegativity are decreasing. Atomic radius, however, when you go from top to bottom, increases. On the left hand side of the periodic table, you'll find more metals. On the right hand side of the periodic table, you'll find more non-metals. Keep in your mind that whenever we are talking about the trends, we always talk about the magnitudes of these quantities, not their signs. So my dear friends, this was a very quick revision of the chapter of periodic properties. Now, if you want to do a thorough revision, please make sure you go and read the chapter of NCRT. And in case you want to do more questions related to this topic, if you want to practice and build your strength for the examination, then please stay subscribed to this channel because if this video is going out today, then tomorrow at 8 p.m. we are going to have a very nice advanced level question solving session for periodic properties. You can pause this video anywhere to look at the details more carefully. Now, I hope that this quick revision of periodic properties chapter was helpful for you. If it was, don't forget to hit that like button. Stay subscribed. I'll see you soon.